Have you ever thought about the job description of a pastor or a bishop? Well, I do know they're supposed to preach, right? Yes. But there's a whole lot more to it. A whole lot more. And we'll talk about it next, coming up on Cutting It Right. Why don't you join me? Well, praise the Lord. This is Reverend Michael Jakes, and this is Cutting It Right. And on today's podcast, we're going to give you an overview, a job description of a pastor, bishop, or an elder. You see, actually, in the Bible, pastor, bishop, and elder are one and the same individual. Paul the Apostle had much to say about this because he himself was a church planner, an apostle, and an evangelist. So we want to listen very carefully to what Paul has to say about these things. It's what's a pastor to do. Coming up next, I pray to be blessed as you listen. Acts 20, and we'll, let's start in verse number 22. We'll start in verse 22. This is Paul speaking to the individuals. Uh, he's speaking to the Ephesian elders. He's speaking to the leaders, the bishops, the pastors, the overseers. He's speaking to uh, those in Ephesus. He says, now I behold, now behold, I go bound in the spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me. In other words, we mentioned last time that he was, he was set on going there, regardless of the situation and regardless of what might befall him, he was determined that he was going to Jerusalem. Verse 23, say that, except that the Holy Ghost witnesses or testifies in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. So even with the knowledge of what the Holy Spirit has already informed him that he would encounter difficulty, bonds and afflictions, bonds and afflictions. He's telling him, the Holy Spirit is telling him that you are going to be seized, arrested, and afflicted, which means you are going to get beaten. Okay? In spite of that, he says in verse 24, none of these things move me. I'm not afraid, I'm not worried, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy. We mentioned the fact last time that finishing your course with joy, finishing his course with joy has to do with knowing that he had done the right thing at the right time knowing that he had done God's will regardless of what he wanted to do. That brings joy when we do what God wants us to do. And the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Preaching the gospel was not just a hobby for Paul. It wasn't just a pastime, something that he did on the side. Preaching the gospel what his, was his life. It was his life's occupation. It was his life's blood. It's what he was. It's, what, it's, what, it's who he was. It's everything about him was the gospel. The gospel, as he says, of the grace of God. He was doing everything in his power as the Lord gave him the ability and the strength to preach, teach, proclaim the gospel. That's what he was about completely he was this man was a one-track mind kind of guy he everything about him was the gospel now verse 25 behold i know that ye all among whom i have gone preaching the kingdom of god shall see my face no more okay he tells guys this is it i won't be back <laughs> i won't be back wherefore I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. And this is why he says that in verse 27. I have shunned to declare, I have not shunned to declare to you the full, the all of the counsel of God. My hands are clean. There's no blood upon my hand. Nobody can look at me and say, I didn't know, I didn't hear, I didn't understand. I have told you everything. I have discharged my duty. My hands are clean. I am pure from the blood of all men. Now, 
he's about to, starting in verse number 28 here, he's going to give them a word of prophecy. He's going to give them a word of prophecy. Something that had not happened yet, but he is prophesying here in verse 28, something that will happen in the future. He says, take heed, be attentive, keep your antennas up, look out for unto yourselves, watch yourselves, and to all the flock. Remember, he's talking to, Paul is speaking Paul is speaking to the leaders of the church in Ephesus. Okay? I'm, I'm, I'm stressing leaders. He's not just speaking to the congregation. He's not speaking to the congregation. He is speaking to the leaders, the elders, the bishops, the pastors. He is speaking to those who are, whose responsibility it is to, to feed the flock. That's who he's talking to. He says, so take heed. Watch yourselves and to everybody else over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers. First thing he says, this is not the prophecy yet. Leading up to the prophecy. Okay? The job of the overseer, elder, bishop, pastor, okay? is to guard protect feed the flock given to them by the Holy Ghost that's the job. That's the job description. That is the job description of an overseer, a pastor, a bishop. That's the job description. Of course, they will preach. Okay? They're going to preach. They're going to teach. But overall, the overall job description, overview, it is your job to guard, protect, and feed the flock given to you by the Holy Ghost. That's the job. That's what a pastor, bishop, elder, overseer is supposed to do. How do they do that? How are they guarding and protecting? They guard and protect the flock by making sure that no Bad teaching comes into the body, into the flock, and infects the flock. Okay? That's the job of the pastor slash bishop. To make sure that they are taught properly. To make sure that no one comes in and tells them things that are untrue to get their mind ablaze, to get them wondering and think it's nothing wrong with it's nothing wrong with seeing a truth and asking questions and, 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 and getting the, the understanding of it. But as he's gonna say in this prophecy, there are gonna be individuals that would come and would try to mess that up. Let me continue. He says that the the over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers, verse twenty eight, to feed the church of God. Remember, the church. To feed the church, the flock, the people. The church is the individuals within the body of Christ. The called out ones. 
of which he hath purchased with his own blood. Verse 28 and 29. Okay. Here's the prophecy. Verse 29. For I know this, that after my departure, when I'm gone, when I leave, when I'm in another city, or after I'm dead, that's when it happened. After I'm dead, it says, Grievous wolves shall enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Grievous wolves shall enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Okay? So, what did we say? What did we say? The job description of a pastor, bishop, elder is job description is God protect and feed the flock given to them by the Holy Ghost what are they, what are they there to guard them from guard from false teaching which the Bible calls the Bible calls false teaching Doctrines of devils or demons. Doctrines of devils. And the individuals who do this are the wolves that he's talking about here in verse 29. Wolves as opposed to sheep. Sheep are naturally don't defend themselves well. A lamb, a sheep, they're very mild-mannered, calm. They've been called stupid. It's just how they are. They're very trusting. They will wander away. That's the nature of a sheep. So, the, the elder bishop pastor is supposed to keep the sheep in line. Make sure the sheep don't get pulled away by a wolf. A wolf, he says, these wolves, these individuals will enter in among you. They will enter in among you. They will come among you and they will begin to teach or preach. Not sparing the flock. Not sparing the flock. In other words, doing the absolute opposite of what the bishop and the pastor, and the elder and the overseer do. Okay? They are, they will not protect. They will not care for. They will not provide for. Uh, and they will not feed the flock properly. The next verse continues in verse 30. It says, also, so he says, number one, there's going to be individuals that are going to come in from the outside and come in and try and spread their uh, false way among you. Number two, he says, also of your own selves shall men arise. Okay? Okay. Those of you, some of you who are here right now, you are going to also become wolves because you are going to yourself begin to speak, it says, perverse things, perverted things. The word perverted here means distorted and corruptible things. You're going to speak, they're going to speak distorted and corruptible things. Now, when did this when did this prophecy take place? The book of Revelation gives us a hint as to when these things took place. They began to take place sometime after Paul died um, in natural in the natural in history. But once again, once this once Paul left and once John died, who wrote the book of Revelation, these things began to happen more and more and more. And this whole these two verses here 
are basically a prophecy that lets us know how the whole let me Catholic Church came to be. How the Catholic Church came to be. Okay? Because what Catholicism is all started from here. It all started right here. It's all it, it's 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 out of line now. It's been out of line for years, hundreds of years now. It's been out of line for a long time. But it all started here. There was no Catholicism in the Bible. There was no Protestantism in the Bible. All these things were not in the Bible until Paul left. John, Paul died. John died. There were no more Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, and the 12 disciples were all gone. So everybody who was left were people who either knew them or knew people that knew them and everybody and, and now everybody was up left up to themselves to try and interpret and figure out what this whole thing means. And how they interpreted it is how it all began to to roll out of control. And the rest is history. So he says, therefore, watch verse 31 Remember that by the space of three years, I cease not to warn everyone day and night with tears. Paul was tenderhearted and compassionate. He cared for the people that he was ministering to. He cared for them. He prayed for them. He taught them. He preached to them. He cared about their spiritual well-being. He didn't want anyone, excuse me, he didn't want anyone to be lost. That was Paul. That was Paul. Every bishop, every pastor ought to have, ought to have. This is why it's a calling. A heart. for the people a heart for a heart for a pastor and a bishop ought to be here's what the Bible says about Jesus the Bible calls Jesus in the book of Hebrews Jesus is called the bishop and shepherd of our souls a bishop and shepherd of our souls and a pastor ought to be the same way as Jesus was. A bishop and shepherd of the souls of the individuals that have been entrusted to him, to him or her by the Holy Ghost. Notice what it says in verse 28. Entrusted to them. Let me go back to verse 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers. No one ought to say, I am a bishop or a pastor on my own. I appoint myself bishop or pastor or elder. You don't appoint yourself nothing, okay? And if someone has put their hand upon you, it's only because the Lord has already apprehended you, okay? The Lord has already called you. So, the bishop and the pastor is a calling that is from the Lord and they got to do this. Given to them by the Holy Ghost. Given. Given. That's how a pastor ought to be. Now, they, pastors are different. The Bible talks about there are individuals uh, who are pastors who are what we call hirelings. Hirelings versus pastors. Pastor, shepherd, bishop, same thing. But a hireling is someone who just hired out to do the job and they don't care about the sheep. They're just there for the money. They're just there for the paycheck. They're just there for what they can get. They're not a real pastor. They might have a pastor in their name. They might have a bishop in front of their name, but they don't care about the people. 
They do care about the money, and they care about the, the prestige, and they care about maybe the popularity. These are hirelings. Okay, those are hirelings. And God has not called them. God has not called a hireling. God has called, God has called pastors. A hireling has called himself. A hireling may have, a hireling may have, a hireling may speak well. A hireling may have much popularity. A, uh, a hireling may have a lot of charisma and have a lot of people follow after them because they are so charismatic. But once again, if it's all about the money and you and the congregation or the flock may not may not initially know or understand that it's all about the money for them. If it's all about the money, this guy doesn't care. He doesn't care who comes in. He doesn't care about who comes in and tells you what. He doesn't matter. He, he all he, and, he, and he's going to tell you the hiding is going to tell you what you want to hear. The hot is going to tell you stuff that's going to tickle your ears. He's not going to tell you anything that's going to make you want to push away and get up from the table and go. Because when you go, your money goes. Okay? That's the hireling. That's the hireling. And they abound. They are all over the place. The pastor, bishop, elder, overseer, they... It is their job to guard the flock given to them. It is not their job to invade your life with rules and regulations and guard the flock. Make sure that what you hear from the word is right and proper. Yes, there are going to be times when the pastor or the bishop or the elder may need to counsel. People may come to him for counsel and they must be ready to counsel. They must be ready to counsel. Okay? That is part of the job description of the pastor, bishop, elder. Okay? But a hireling, forget that. Verse number 32. And now, brethren, he says, I commend or I commit, I entrust, I deposit you to God. That's the best place to put people in God's hands. Okay, that's the best place to put people. And to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. We talked about this last week. We talked about the fact that what the word does. Notice that he calls the word of God the word of grace. It's the word of his grace, the Bible. Scripture is the word of grace. This grace is able to build you up and give you an inheritance, an inheritance when you obey among all them which are sanctified. And that's the sanctified. That's talking about all those who are saved are sanctified. Every single last one. Okay. Okay. I've coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. Once again, he's saying, look, I am not greedy. I have not asked you guys for any money. I'm not trying to, you know, I'm not trying to empty your pockets. He says, I have coveted no man's silver or gold. And this is the characteristic of a true minister of God. Okay? A true minister of God will not be selfish and all they want is your money. Uh, wolves are known by their greed, by their self-interest, and by other fruits. That's a wolf. 